Eric, thank you very much. <clears throat> and this is really informal. So these folks are spending more time at the food table than at tables. That's just, that's very appropriate. That's very good. The fact that Ken Allen, a longtime minister at the Memorial Road Church of Christ, is sitting right next to the food. That's also very appropriate. Kent, uh, many of you all know Kent. He, um, he serves as my chief of staff at Oklahoma Christian. Does a great, great job at the university. We have Grady King. Grady is the um, OC's church relations, church resources uh, director. He does a lot of stuff. He's preached also his whole career and uh, does a lot of things uh, for, um, for, for congregations all over the place. So I'm really glad these, these fellows are with me. And I'm glad you all are with me. Thank you for giving me this chance to come in and talk. Uh, so here's the deal. I really like sharing good news. I really like sharing happy stories. I really like sharing things that we can all be very pleased and excited about. Uh, what I'm really talking about tonight are uh, some challenges and some encouragements, but boy, a lot of these are challenges. What I'm going to share with you is probably information that you already have a general idea of, but this will kind of put some context maybe and maybe a little bit more detail or data to some of the things that, that, we're, uh, that we're going to be talking about. But I do promise we're going to end on a high note. We are going to talk about some encouraging things as well. And at that point, I'm going to want to ask Grady to come up to the microphone and speak as well for a few minutes about some really practical things that we are seeing uh, that is, is very possible now at this time. Okay, so here is tonight's program, Challenges and Encouragements, both for Churches of Christ and for Christian higher education, including OC. As I mentioned, it's real informal, so if you want to ask a question, if you want to disagree with something, if you want to ask for additional clarification, please do so. I'll probably go ahead and try to move through this, though, unless I see that you want to talk about a piece to this, which would be great. So, 2020, this is a big year for all sorts of reasons, uh, difficult in so many ways. Christianity at large and universities at large are having challenges um, that maybe aren't new, but they've certainly been accelerated during this time. And our fellowship, Churches of Christ and Christian colleges are not immune to this. But, you know, we have, we have faced difficult times before, and uh, there's a lot of things to give us hope. So I'm going to share several sets of challenges and encouragements. So let's first talk about our faith fellowship, Churches of Christ. Um, boy, all over Oklahoma and beyond, our fellowship is um, dealing with some issues that, frankly, are happening on a much larger scale throughout Christendom. Uh, let's talk about aging members. Let's talk about being less evangelistic. Let's talk about maybe we are in some ruts that we ought to consider. Hey, are there things that we can do differently that might reach our communities in different ways? So. A few years ago, from 2014 to 2019, there was a national survey that was done among 50 congregations that Dr. Tim Woodruff did. Now, I think that some of you all here at this congregation are aware of some of the data from this, but let me just share these things quickly. Fifty churches were involved in this survey over five or six years, a wide variety of congregations. Sixteen states were represented, 46 cities, almost 10,000 volunteer respondents to the surveys, the churches that were involved have 50 to 1,000 members, so from fairly small in rural areas to pretty large in urban areas, but also suburban uh, throughout. There were really three questions that were real simple questions asked of the members. The first question was, how old are you? I mean, again, not a difficult question to answer. So here is the spread of the 9,500 respondents. 60% identified themselves as being 50 years of age or older. The largest uh, decade of age were those who were over 70 years of age. If you look at the lower part of this chart, only 15% who participated in the survey were 29 years of age or younger. Now, let me stop just for a second and say um, this, this was not presented as a statistically rigorous uh, um, type of a survey that, that had, you know, 
a, a small amount of, of pro or con to it in terms of how close to, to reality it is. And, and we all know that often it's older people that tend to vote more often than younger people. So it could have been that there were just more older individuals that filled out this survey, volunteer survey, than young people. But the reality is we kind of, if you sit in the back of a congregation and you kind of look at who's sitting in front of you, at least back in pre-COVID days, um, we can tell anecdotally that our fellowship is aging. So that is an issue that this survey identified. A second issue came from a second question. The question was, how long have you been a Christian? 47% um, of those that were surveyed have been Christians for 40 years or longer. There is something special about stability for that length of time. But there's also uh, something on the other end talking about less than 3% have been Christians for 5 years or less. So what that kind of means is not only are we an older fellowship, but we're not adding a lot of younger members. We are not the evangelistic fellowship that we were just a few decades ago. The authors of the study say, consequently, members of our, of our churches of Christ are dying at a rapid rate, and very few new younger members are replacing them. So we'll have implications from this that I'll talk about in just a second. Third question was, how long have you been at this present congregation where you are today? Well, the largest group, 37%, had been members of their congregation for 20 or more years. Then a smaller group, about a quarter, had been there for 10 to 19 years, and then about 35% for less than 10 years. Now, stability is a great thing. There is something really positive about stability. But there could be another side to that coin also, which is, have we been in one place for so long that the way that we've always done something maybe we begin to think that's the only way we can do it. Now, I'm not talking about doctrinal matters. I'm just talking about simply practical things on reaching other people. So sometimes we might even end up in a rut without knowing we're in that rut or in that pattern. So the survey uh, sponsors, that the fellows who carried out the survey, then analyzed this data. We're getting older, we're less evangelistic, and we're not really moving around very much. And what did they conclude? Well, the implications are this. There are going to be a lot of funerals in the next few years. Those funerals in the next few years are going to cause, frankly, a catastrophic loss. Who is going to be passing away more? It is our significant leaders, our generous givers. We were talking about Memorial Road has had three elders, long, long time elders, who just passed away in the last few months. Uh, and a couple of them passed away in about the last month and a half. And um, it's a very, very difficult thing that's happening really across the country. Well, also, as we, we know this as well, sometimes our newest members have the greatest amount of zeal for being involved in things and working. And that's a precious, precious thing. But with fewer new and younger converts and people passing away, uh, there is very likely going to be a downturn in active involvement in ministry in local congregations, and that does not spell good news for us. And the final point that they say is um, there is likely to be a growing resistance to thinking about different methods for reaching people or providing for the community just because we are typically used to what we're used to and what we experience all of the time. They made some other findings from this survey. One is some of these congregations, of these 50 congregations, they believe are going to lose half of their members within 10 years. Now, that's not 10 years starting from today. Remember, these surveys were done between 2014 and 2019. So actually, some of these things are happening right now and with a much shorter time frame than in 10 years. They also said at almost all of these congregations are going to lose half of their members within 20 years at the present trends. They say that a quarter are going to be forced to close their doors within 10 to 20 years, especially if those congregations have mortgages or they have deferred maintenance that they have not accounted for over time. And the congregations that have full-time ministers might not be able to afford those full-time ministers as their generous and older donors' members are passing away. 
that will accelerate some of the negative trends with some of these congregations as full-time ministers are being lost. So, to the degree that this data is suggestive for Churches of Christ as a whole, it's a, it's a pretty scary set of implications. And then, they have this quote. Because some of this is, um, it's a little bit startling for some of us. Uh, if you are a part of a healthy congregation, if you're a part of a congregation that is growing and vibrant and doing well, then you might not be thinking about what is likely to be happening in lots of surrounding areas. We attend Memorial Road in, in Edmond, right next to the Oklahoma Christian campus. It's a big church. Lots of things are going on. A lot of people involved in it. A lot of new folks coming in. And so we don't think so much about what's happening where we came from, eastern Oklahoma, small town, or what's happening in western Oklahoma as well. So this quote is, with few exceptions, and the exceptions are in those Church of Christ bubbles, the big urban areas, especially those areas around a Church of Christ college or university, unless you're in one of those bubbles, this is a demographic tsunami which is overwhelming or will overwhelm many of our churches, and it's really going to change the landscape of our fellowship. And they say, look at the West Coast for a real example of that, because the West Coast uh, is probably further along in this process than we are, and our fellowship is in a real difficult, lean time out on the West Coast. Well, now that you're depressed about all that, let me share, you some challenge, share with you some challenges about Christian colleges so I can add to that melancholy feeling you might have right now. Um, so, Church of Christ Universities, and by the way, Church of Christ Universities, they're really a, across the country. So, we're talking about, let me see which ones I can name. I'll start on the West Coast. So, Pepperdine, Lubbock Christian College, uh, Co Lubbock Christian University, Abilene Christian University, York College, Oklahoma Christian, Harding, uh, Freed Hardeman, Faulkner University, Lipscomb University, Florida College, Ohio Valley University, Heritage uh, Christian, there's, there's some small schools also. That's, that's what we're talking about here. There are fewer Church of Christ young people today, and that number seems to be shrinking. Uh, the value of traditional college education is under attack, and there are lots of alternatives that young people have today about college. Now, I'm talking specifically about Christian colleges and universities in this segment, but the reality is... As goes the church, so goes Christian colleges. And as go Christian colleges, in a lot of ways, so goes the church. So these are actually heavy pressures on two groups that are really tied closely together. So every year uh, in the fall, uh, a fellow named Trace Heber, he's a, a member of our fellowship. He is a professor at Lipscomb University. He sends an email out to the Christian College presidents, and he asks a couple of questions. One question is, how many freshmen do you have? A second question is, how many of those freshmen this fall are members of the Churches of Christ? Last fall, we don't have the data yet for this fall because it's too early on in the semester. So my data is from last year. Last fall, only 37% of the freshmen coming to the Church of Christ colleges and universities were members of the Churches of Christ. Now, in 2000, less than 20 years ago, that number was 66%. So it went from two-thirds of the freshmen to just over one-third of the freshmen. So from in that 19-year period, it's about a 58% decrease in the headcount of of young men and young women from our fellowship going to one of our fellowship colleges. Now, in the fall of 2020, this fall for Oklahoma Christian, we're at 48%. 48% of our freshmen are members of the Churches of Christ. The Christian Church, our, um, our cousins in faith, uh, have 13%, and uh, the Baptist um, uh, faith group has 13% of our freshmen as well. This is uh, a number that is um, dramatically low compared to 20 or 25 years ago. There are only two uh, Church of Christ colleges and universities that are above the 50% mark. And with the average of all of them being 37%, you can see that some are way below that figure as well. Question for you. Yes, sir. Baptist churches, that statistic, have 13% Church of Christ students? 
or no, no, no. This is Baptist no. at OC. Yeah, at Oklahoma Christian oh, in OC. our in, uh, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that 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 statistic there is thirteen percent of our freshmen this fall come out of the Baptist faith. Okay, so this is the same information, but if you if you don't like narrative as much and you're more drawn to charts or graphs, uh, then here this one is for you. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna step over to the graph so I can point just a couple things out for you. So. Here is the year 2000, and it goes to 2019, last fall. The blue line up here, this represents the total number of freshmen at the Church of Christ Colleges and Universities. So, 6,643. By the way, just talking about freshmen, we've gone from 6,600 down to less than 5,000 to 4,900. So, just in and of itself, as an enrollment trend, that is not a good trend. This orange line below, this represents the portion of the blue line that are students from our faith fellowship, from Churches of Christ. 4,400 in the year 2000. So 4,400 out of 6,600, that's the two-thirds, or the 66% there. But this number has dropped to less than 1,900, 1,856. And most of these years, with the exception of, of one or two years in the last 19 years, it has been a steady decline. What, what was your enrollment, your total enrollment, from the year 2000 to 2019? So has that increased or remained fairly low? Very good question. Let me report, repeat that just in case somebody is watching this later. The question was, what's the total enrollment of all the Church of Christ colleges and universities? Um, I don't know specifically what the number was in 2000. I will say, though, that this really is representing the traditional student, the 18 to 22 or 23 year old that just graduates high school, you want them to move to your campus and get a four year degree. That number, I believe, has decreased for the Church of Christ Colleges and Universities, the, 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 all the traditional four year. However, on the non-traditional numbers, the Church of Christ Colleges and Universities have a lot more master's programs, there are some doctoral programs, um, there are a lot more part-time students that are doing things online. So the total headcount might be higher, but that kind of sweet spot that we, have, uh, that we have targeted over the decades that most people think of as college, that number has decreased. Well, now all universities, frankly, are kind of in some ways in the same boat because there is a decline in high school graduates. I want to, I'll give you a bit of detail about this. There's also been a pretty dramatic decline in the number of international students that are coming to the United States. And, uh, and society just doesn't view a college degree quite as being worth it. It's too expensive, there's too much debt, and man, it doesn't guarantee you a, a great job. So this is kind of an interesting uh, piece of the story. So the college-going population of traditional high school graduates peaked in 2013, about seven years ago. If you remember back in 2007, 2008, the Great Recession hit the country, and it was a pretty dramatic, difficult time financially for institutions and employers. Well, interestingly, experts, demographers look back and say it was during that time period that a lot of young families, because of economic uncertainty, decided they were going to delay or not have children. Well, that's not a big deal to colleges and universities, at least at that time, but 17 or 18 years later, that's a real problem. Because those kids that would have been born and would have been ready for college, all of a sudden, aren't there. So. Uh, High school graduate numbers have dropped um, steadily since 2013. They're going to drop by 15%, it looks like, going into 2025, 2026. The other interesting thing for our Church of Christ um, fellowship colleges, universities, is that the student bodies will be more diverse in the future, which is a really positive thing but we might not be equipped quite as, as well. We might not be ready for that quite as much. This year is the year that um, the majority actually became a plurality for individuals in our country that are 18 years of age and younger. There's now not a majority of, of Caucasians. It's a plurality. It's dropped below the 50% mark. In 2045, all the trends are 
that we will be a majority minority country. There will not be one one ethnic group that is a majority. Now that's not I don't think that that's a problem, but that is going to change things. And are universities like Oklahoma Christian and other places, are we ready? Because most of the growth is in the Latino or Hispanic population. And frankly, we don't have as many Spanish-speaking faculty, staff, and administrators as we will need to have to make sure that we are ready for, for these changes as they occur. This map of the United States, it's got some red and it's got some blue. It has nothing to do with politics, okay? This is not, um, I'm not predicting anything next month. Let me tell you what this is. This map uh, is a color-coded map showing what's happening with high school graduates during this time period, between 2012 and 2029. If you are a red state on this map, the number of high school graduates is declining during this time period by more than 15%. So if you see kind of up in the north, the Rust Belt, the, uh, the New England states, all those red states, you do not want to be a college or a university up in the New England states. Um, even though we know about students traveling across the country to go to college or university, the vast majority remain within about a 50 to 75 mile radius of where their home is. So they really most don't travel far out of that space. Now, the good news for our church colleges and universities, we don't have any institutions up in that area. However, you'll notice that there are some other red states, and unfortunately, Arkansas and Alabama and Tennessee, home to four of our well, five of our Christian colleges, they are in these red states. Oklahoma, we're in an orange state. This suggests we're going to lose between 7.5 and 15% of our high school graduation numbers during this time period. That is not a good thing. Texas is yellow. Uh, they are um, going from either 2.5% growth to 2.5% decrease. But the entire increase in the state of Texas is due to Hispanic population number growth, as it is in a lot of places. So this is kind of a, another concerning factor for colleges and universities in general, and certainly for uh, those in our fellowship. Oklahoma Christian, uh, here's what we look like. About half of our students are Oklahomans. About a quarter of our students come from the state of Texas. And then we have a number of other states that share just a small piece of that, and about 15% of our students are international students. Uh, by the way, the Texans, we invite them to bring a bag of dirt with them, and then we let them spread that on the campus so they can tell their grandparents they're being educated on Texas soil. So, yes, sir. Don, just had a thought as you were going through this map and just leading up to this is... Has there been any thought, has there been any application to how does the decline of the traditional family overlay with, because I mean, that's, and that's why I asked Kelly a while ago, as I said, you know, we keep seeing this, we see a decline in the Church of Christ membership, you know, what's happening in churches, period, you know, nationwide, and we see the decline in uh, graduating seniors, the decline in uh, college-going students here, you know, what's the overlay, what's the correlation back to the uh, traditional family structure? And I understand you may not have an answer for that, but I mean, it's just a thought I'm sitting here having. You know, I, let me repeat the question, um, um, and then I have a speculation. I don't, I don't have a verifiable answer. The question is, what, kind of what's the context or the overlay on all of these issues with regard to uh, fewer high school students, decrease in the size of, of our faith fellowship, fewer of our Church of Christ kids going through high school. How is all that impacted or involved with in uh, what we see as uh, fewer traditional family structures or families having difficulty staying intact? Um, a lot of single parent families, th things like that. I, I think there is correlation and impact. Maybe not causation, but I know that one of, the, you know, one of the major concerns in the narrative about college and university is that it's too expensive for students today. Well, you know, if you're thinking about it's too expensive for a family that has an intact 
uh, uh, you know, father and mother with maybe one or two jobs, well, how much more difficult is it going to be in a single parent family where, where finances are much more difficult or, or what have you? Um, and, and also, I think there are greater struggles in a lot of those single parent families that, frankly, uh, cause young people more difficulty in school, to succeed in school, in elementary, in junior high, and, and high school years. And so the very thought of college is certainly not an automatic for them. And so I think all those things do make this more difficult. I haven't seen a study, though, that says this is caused by this. That's a really great question. Okay, these, um, these charts uh, are another set of charts that make me uh, depressed. Um, this depicts at Oklahoma Christian the number of international students that we have had. You see that the greatest peak, and by the way, that top line is the total of undergraduates plus the graduate students. The middle line there, that kind of green line, uh, that is our graduate students working on master's programs, and then the red line below our undergraduate students. We peaked back in 2016, and we are, we've been in decline. In fact, we're 60% down. Those numbers might be more dire than other places, but almost all colleges and universities are experiencing this same thing. There's a state school very near us that has had a large, large population of students from Nepal. It's kind of interesting how that began and happened, but those student numbers are way, way down. The number of Chinese students are down. Saudi Arabian students in our country are way down. That was actually happening because of some oil price issues back a number of years ago. What's interesting, though, is international students seem to be suggesting that they don't feel as welcome in the United States over the last few years, just kind of whether that's... that's uh, reality or whether it's perception, uh, they have felt that way, but what you have seen, while numbers of international students at U.S. colleges is down, number of international students at Canadian colleges has gone way up. So that might suggest, in fact, that they don't feel as welcome here as they do maybe in other places. And then also, dissatisfaction with higher education. Boy, a recent survey was done by a group called New America. Two-thirds of Americans are unsatisfied with U.S. higher education, and 50% say getting a high-quality education after high school is unaffordable. This is not good news for college presidents, brothers and sisters. Um, man, this is, a big, this is a big thing to try to overcome. Now, I'll tell you, while those might be true on the national level, although I don't even know that they're necessarily fully true, there are horror stories, of course, um, but I don't think it's quite that bad, but I know at Oklahoma Christian it is not that bad. Our student debt for our average graduate is lower than the national average, and we are less expensive tuition-wise by about $10,000 than other private colleges and universities on average throughout the United States. The reality is, even though our advertised price is higher than some state schools here in the state of Oklahoma, our net price after scholarships, it's less expensive to go to Oklahoma Christian than it is to go to OU. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty important thing. Uh, and we probably need to tell that story better. Students also have all sorts of alternatives. Community college are, man, they, those, that's a very important avenue for a lot of students. Uh, career tech or VOTech here in the state of Oklahoma, uh, we've got probably the best career tech system in the nation. It's really, really strong. Well-funded, well-organized, uh, very well-equipped. So that's great for our, uh, for our state and for young people that avail themselves of career tech. Uh, it creates a really high level of competition for places like Oklahoma Christian. Certificates. Google just a few weeks ago announced that they were coming out with a certificate that students could take in a short period of time for pretty inexpensive cost that they said employers would prefer just as much as they would a four-year college degree for those students. So it's quicker, it's cheaper, it gets them into the workforce. 
I don't think it is as good a degree. Now, it might be really important in this narrow area, but I think what the Christian colleges provide is something way broader than just narrow area of focus and expertise. But nonetheless, this is going to be another area of serious competition for the colleges and universities. Gap years, uh, you know, some young people decide they're going to uh, they're going to see the world, or they're going to figure everything out. They're going to maybe you know get a really great paying job for a year before they go to college, and so they decide to take a gap year. More often than not. Uh, they stay on the sofa and play a lot of video games that year. So our encouragement is, and I, I probably just overstated that, we're taping this, I apologize, if you're taking a gap year, I hope it's going really well for you. <laughs> um, but, man, you can, you can find yourself at college. You can, you can make progress uh, and you can figure a lot of things out in college. So I'd, I'd really encourage that. And then competency-based, it's very interesting. A, a future focus of education is how can you get college credit for experience that you have learned and developed on the job? This is going to become an increasingly important, it's like The Apprentice. It's like bringing back, not the TV show, it's like bringing back the old apprenticeship, uh, whether you're in a, in a trade or, or in one of the guilds uh, back, in, back in the day. This thing is coming back, and it could be very, very significant and important. And OC wants to be, frankly, a part of this because we think there's great value in this. Okay, I've given you some challenging information about Churches of Christ. I've given you some challenging information about colleges and universities, especially Church of Christ colleges and universities. Let me go ahead and take us even further down the path of melancholy, I want to talk about something that impacts both our fellowship and our universities. I want to talk about uh, kind of some distinctions between what we are used to, what our beliefs and opinions are, and what young people might have today. Uh, and here are a couple of bullet points. There are fewer millennials that are committing to one church congregation. I'll talk about that a bit more. Students today are asking level one questions, and, and I think this is really fascinating. I'll unpack that here in a second. And beliefs are changing among young people, even those in our faith fellowship. Uh, and then anxiety. I'm not going to say any more about this, except to say that at all colleges and universities, we see much greater anxiety, and it's greater year after year after year for our young people. Uh, we have much larger counseling staffs than we've ever had before, and they are still overburdened. Yes, sir? Yeah, if, since you're on that question, one of my curiosities was, with this year, with the COVID experience and everything, do you see a major difference as far as the experience for the kids? Certainly different. Do you see a an, an increase in the stress levels and problems with, with coping with What's happening that's affecting their education? Is that making a big difference for you? Quick question is, during this time of COVID, are we seeing an even greater uh, number of anxiety issues or depression issues or other things among our college students? You know, I, I tell you what's interesting, um, several aspects to this. Uh, if you take today and compare that to 10 years ago, it is a dramatic difference, even taking COVID out of the picture. Uh, and if you go back 20 years, even more dramatically different than that. Um, there is a lot, it's also kind of, uh, I, I, I almost wanted to say funny, that's not a very good use, word to use in this. In, a, in the course of a semester, what we also find is, uh, there doesn't seem to be as much anxiety or stress the first couple of weeks of the semester. The last few weeks of the semester, anxiety is out the roof. All those carefree things that you were doing early in the semester and not going to class and not studying and not doing your papers, it kind of comes back and it complicates everything at the end. Unfortunately, what we've been seeing over the years is that, uh, that, that late semester stress and anxiety is coming earlier and earlier and earlier in the year. Now, what about COVID? Um, I, I would say that there has been an increase, but I, but I also think that there is a lot more people understanding that these are issues and so people are asking each other about these things. 
Um, we have at Oklahoma Christian, you've probably read about colleges and universities that have active COVID cases on campus and what they are doing. Some, some colleges and universities have, to, have had to shut down and send all their students home. The experts say that's not what you want to do. You, if you have an outbreak on your campus, the idea of sending a bunch of, um, of, of COVID positive people out to their families is really not a good idea. On our campus, what we have been doing is we have been testing pretty regularly. We actually have a service that comes on two days a week that provides free tests to students and community members. When people are tested and they do result in a positive test, we isolate those students. They might isolate in their own room or in a different room that we have some surplus rooms. Uh, and then we go back and contact trace. And so if you have been around this person who tested positive and you've been around them for 15 minutes or longer within six feet without wearing a mask, you go into quarantine. You are also, it's the same as isolation, except isolation is a phrase for a COVID positive person. Quarantine is for those people who've been around. Now the problem is we are aware that when you are by yourself in your room, it is not good for you mentally, mental health wise. By the way, at the beginning of the semester before all this started, I imagined quarantine and isolation, you know, you're putting somebody in a dark room and you're locking them in and, and you slide food under the door to them. That, that is not what this is like, okay? I just I want to be clear about that. What we have actually done, by the way, we deliver meals to the door three times a day. It's like a really nice luxury hotel, frankly, on the Oklahoma Christian campus. What we have, um, what we have also determined to do is we encourage those students in isolation or in quarantine to leave their room, not to be near anybody, but to get out on the trail that goes around the Oakland Christian campus because we want them out in fresh air and in daylight. We also have seen a number of cases where students are actually sitting on one side, they're in their room at their window and their friends are outside the room, they take chairs outside, sit out there, and they talk on the phone to each other because we know that isolation and quarantine by yourself is not a good recipe for, for, for anxiety. Um, so it's gone up a little bit, but we're doing lots of things to try to take care of that. Um, okay, let me... Boy, David Kinneman is the president of the Barna Research Group. Barna Research does a lot of surveying of, uh, of, of Christians asking questions about church attendance and, and belief and all. This is a fascinating study. It came out in a book called Faith for Exiles. I think the book's about a year and a half old. Now get this. This is a national survey of thousands of people between the ages of 18 and 29. And these are people who grew up as Christians, in Christian families, going to church. And the question was, where are you now in your spiritual life? 22%, they say they are ex-Christians. They no longer identify as Christians, so one out of five, and they are, they are termed prodigals. The next group, 30%, are nomads. They have not attended church during the past month, and the majority haven't been involved in a church for six months. They're just not going anymore. So right there, those two categories, over half of the, of the young people who grew up in church between the age of 18 and 29 are now no longer a part of a church. 38% are referred to as habitual churchgoers. They describe themselves as Christian. They've attended church in the past month, but they are not intentional, engaged disciples. Only 10% are, frankly, the ones that we want our kids to be. I mean, one out of 10. We're talking one out of 10 of kids raised in churches. These are the resilient disciples. They attend church regularly. They trust the Bible as authority. They're committed to Jesus, and they want to transform society as a faith outcome. These are really alarming numbers that, uh, that Kinnaman and Matlock have identified. I mentioned the level one, uh, level two, level three questions. So he, here's, the, here's the background for this. Uh, the president of SMU down in Dallas is a fellow named Gerald Turner. Gerald Turner is a member of the Preston Road Church of Christ. Back in 2016, 
he came to a Christian Scholars Conference. Every year, the Church of Christ universities get together in early June, usually at Lipscomb, sometimes at Lubbock Christian, and they bring in scholars and, and talk about different issues and things. Well, in 2016, they asked President Turner to put to, uh, a paper together about young people today and, and what's happening in colleges. And so he presented a paper, and I got to sit on the panel that talked about his findings, his, his theory. And I was with the, uh, the Lubbock Christian president, the Lipscomb University president, maybe another. He sent the paper out, Gerald Turner sent the paper out to us early, and I read it, and I was kind of uh, intrigued and a little bit surprised by it. So I asked some colleagues on campus to read the paper, and I asked them, do you agree with this? And they said, without da a doubt, this is what the situation is. So here it is as, as he described it. Students today typically are asking level one questions. Level one is the most foundational question there is. Is there a God? That's the question they're asking. If they answer that question affirmatively, they then move to a second question. That level two question is, okay, so how do I access God? How do I connect and create a relationship? Well, is it through Christianity or is it in some other way, Buddhism or Islam or Judaism? Well, let's say they answer the first question, there is a God. Let's say they answer the second question, that Christianity is the way to connect to that God. There's a third level of questions, and honestly, these are the questions that us older people tend to be focused on. And those are questions that deal with church, church practice and doctrine. How do we do this? Why do we do that? Um, and Gerald Turner says, so we have older Christians that are talking about these level three questions, and we're talking about those level questions with young people, but the young people aren't even thinking about questions up there. They are busy with the more foundational questions. Is there a God in his Christianity the right way to connect with him? So, so Gerald Turner says, boy, there's a lot of problems with this. One is, Church of Christ College Presidents, your older donors, your trustees are talking on one level, but your students they are all asking questions on a very different level. And we've got to be very, very attuned to that. The very things that, that we are interested in, because we have already made some decisions and determinations, and we've kind of assumed, I've kind of assumed that everybody has made those same assumptions and decisions. The reality is they haven't. And so at a Christian college, what a great place to do more in the way of apologetics, to do more in the way of talking about why it is more than reasonable to believe in God. So an example of this, um, a year ago there, there was a student at Oklahoma Christian, a, a student athlete. This student athlete was in a, a, a first year Bible class for, for freshmen. And, uh, and the teacher taught the class and at the end of the class, everybody else leaves, and this student comes down to the front. He, he noticed that she was kind of hanging around, so she finally comes down, and uh, she says, Hey, Professor, can I ask you a question? And he said, Well, sure. And she said, Okay, I've heard about, I've heard about Jesus all my life, and I know, I know he was a good, a good man, and I know that a lot of people follow him today. And I know that he was killed, but you said something in class, and I, I want to ask you about this. He said, well, yeah, go ahead. And she goes, okay, I knew he was crucified, and, he, and he, was, he, he died, and he was buried. But are you telling me, are, are you telling me that then he was raised from the dead three days later? And the professor said, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm telling you. That student got so excited about that, she went back to her team that afternoon at practice and was going up to everybody else and saying, did you know, did you know that Jesus was raised from the dead? She even told the coach that, and the coach called the Bible professor back to tell him what kind of impact that he had had on her. Now, I kind of love that story, but it kind of hits me right in the face because I'm assuming that everybody at Oklahoma Christian University knows the story of Jesus. 
And if there are students at OC that don't know the story of Jesus, man, what about throughout Enid? And what about throughout Edmond? And what about throughout Watonga and Woodward and everywhere? And so, man, sometimes I think we need to really focus on what level of questions or interest are our young people uh, at. And then I want to I talk about this briefly. Uh, boy, there are also changing beliefs and opinions that young people have. And, I, and you all know these things because you have probably heard these and experienced these. But things that historically have been important to us, to me, are not as important to young people today. And I've got to be aware of that, and that kind of impacts how I can communicate and relate to them. Brand loyalty, a lot of us have grown up being loyal to our brands, and that brand can be clothing, or a car, or a type of a refrigerator, or the church. And brand loyalty is not something that's very common among young people today. Man, I grew up uh, every time the doors opened, I was at church. And I think a lot of us have had that experience growing up. Young people, not so much today. Uh, instrumental worship. A lot of young people today say that's not a big deal. Uh, and a lot of us have grown up thinking it was a very big deal. The role of women at church, that also is something that a lot of young people see very differently than others of us see. Politics used to be all about parties, loyalty to parties, but young people today are far more loyal to issues, and interestingly, those issues often really revolve around what they view as marginalized people, people that don't have a shot in the world, and that's been a change over the years. And then maybe the most explosive area, and maybe the area that has changed the most uh, over the last, I don't know, 10 years or so is all the issues surrounding uh, the LGBT community and, um, and, and how, uh, how people feel about LGBTQ issues. Let me tell you where Oklahoma Christian is. Um, Oklahoma Christian University, we've got, well, we have a, we have a written uh, community covenant. I'll come back to the Safe at Home Chapel here in a second. So quite simply, uh, we have a written covenant that our trustees and university leadership adopted some time ago that is really true today for us. We believe and we understand and we honor that God's biblical plan for sexual relations is that they are part of a marriage between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. That's the Oklahoma Christian um, uh, view and, and belief of this. Now in our OC covenant we also say that we're committed uh, to demonstrate love and respect for people, for, for everybody, even those that have views that differ from ours. But that doesn't change that other part of the covenant where we believe this is what God's will is. We will love and be kind and respect people, but this is what we believe. A few years ago, up until about five years ago, chapel at Oklahoma Christian, there was really one way to be engaged in everyday chapel. And we had we have everyday chapel on campus. That was everybody met together in a really big auditorium. Well, got to the point where that really big auditorium wasn't big enough for our student body. And so we decided, we also realized that some young people really connect better or they are impacted more in smaller group settings than in big settings. So we created some other chapel experiences that students could engage in. Some of them were related to, uh, to academic majors. So our engineering department, it would put on a chapel from time to time for students majoring in engineering. Same thing over in art and design. Uh, we had things like uh, missions chapel. If students were interested in missions or they had been on short-term missions, they could gather together during this particular missions chapel. We had a chapel for young men that wanted to be preachers, and they would get up there and they would give their sermons to their friends, to students. Unfortunately, they would also give them with their Bible faculty sitting on the front row, who as soon as they were done, the faculty would then critique the speaker. And so that was probably the roughest chapel, I think, probably to go through. We even had a chapel. Now, 
I'm kind of talking about this in, in the past tense. Uh, I, I will tell you, we have reduced our chapel attendance requirements this semester. There is still, uh, there are still uh, requirements that our students have to undergo, but we are reducing our really large gatherings because of the pandemic. But these sm many of these smaller chapels are still happening. The most popular one over the years was called Great Songs Chapel. It would meet every Friday in... Judd Theater. Judd Theater seats about 250 or so. Great Songs Chapel every Friday. They would be at least 325 people crammed into this uh, small theater. Every week I would think to myself, I hope this is not the week that the fire marshal comes to chapel because I will be in trouble. In Great Songs Chapel it was really strange. Young people flocking in there. It was all scripture reading and hymn singing. And you could not sing a song in there unless it was 400 years or older. Now, one of our Bible faculty members, he said, you know, I think all, all the students are going to that because I think they think that they're learning brand new songs in there because they've never heard any of these uh, old songs before. Well, there's another chapel that, that we have had also. It's called Safe at Home Chapel. There are gay students at Oklahoma Christian University. That really shouldn't be a surprise. There are students that have same-sex attraction at every college and university, public or private in the country, and in all, I mean, every community, there are individuals that are gay or have same-sex attraction. We had some, uh, some faculty and staff that wanted to work with these students, that wanted to connect with these students, and so they are sponsoring a chapel called Safe at Home. So it's a chapel where uh, not only do um, gay students attend, but other students can attend. They're friends or people that just want to kind of be there to be a, a support or someone that, that one can lean on. Let me tell you about the rules for this chapel, though. And I've talked about these rules both with our entire faculty and staff, with the leaders of this chapel. Uh, and by the way, I have spoken to our entire student body in big chapel and in this Safe at Home Chapel, and I have shared the things out of the OC Covenant, what we believe God's plan for sexual relations are between a man and a woman in the marriage context. I also talk about how people that see things differently need to be able to relate and connect with one another and how they can talk about their differences. And I think the greatest example of that comes out of Galatians when Paul realized that Peter was no longer fellowshipping with Gentile Christians. And what did Paul do? He actually went face to face with Peter and asked him questions and talked to him about it. I think that's the right model for us to talk to people who have differences. But in this chapel, here are the rules. I've got some people that have told me, you cannot allow a student who is gay to be a student at Oklahoma Christian University. You just can't allow that. Or if you know of a student who's applying who is gay, they shouldn't be allowed to come here. You've got to just dismiss their application. Science, I love science. God, God created it. But are we, are, we, are we teaching these things in such a way that we are completely teaching and accepting an inerrancy of Scripture? Are we, are we accepting, are we teaching sciences in a way that this is a young earth, that this is a created earth. Are we standing on those foundational truths, or do you find that we're having to surrender more and more in order to keep our Christian colleges simply afloat? Yeah. So I, I think if we were, if, if we were off, great, great question, and thank you for asking that. I love, you've obviously thought about this, and this is important, and I, and I admire that. Uh, if... If we were making decisions merely to stay afloat, then I would be changing a lot of things at the university. I mean, including this one. I mean, this is a very well-articulated uh, objective. Hey, this is what we believe that God has called us to. Uh, with regard to our sciences, our faculty, all of our faculty members are, are Christians. And, and our scientists on faculty, they, they believe actually the whole debate that seems to be full of sound bites out there that says either you believe in science 
before you believe in God, that's just not even the right conversation because God created science. And, and there is far more agreement. Um, in fact, man, a lot of the, a lot of the supposed contradictions are very surface oriented contradictions. And when you actually dig in deeper, there is really good reason to believe that, I mean, that, that God created this and this is, this is what the Bible says and this is how science agrees with that. So I, I, and I think we have some of our strongest, most fervent Christians on faculty among our scientists, actually. Um, so I, so I, I understand what you're saying. And I mean, I do think the world has changed around us. And I think that we are trying to navigate um, a, a world that's very different in terms of beliefs and in terms of opinions and what are very stridently held views among much of the, of the society that we are in while holding to the fact that, man, we believe in God who has given us a plan that we are, whatever else we do in life, we are to follow God's plan. Um, so, I... We also, I mean, we go back and remind each other regularly, hey, we want our students to have a really great education, but if they get a really great ed education and they don't get a Christian education, I mean, there's, there's no real good reason for Oklahoma Christian to exist. We might as well go away because a student can get just a good education in a lot of different places. And we've got to make a difference, not just for them scholastically, but we've got to make a difference for them spiritually. Amen. Yeah. Um, and we know, and part of all this is that, man, we are so dependent on our church fellowship. As the church goes, so goes the Christian colleges. But as the Christian colleges go, so go the church. I mean, it is such a hand in glove. We are so important for each other, and that's that's why I'm even grateful that we can have this conversation tonight. Um, okay, God bless you. Okay, that's all the bad news. Let me give you a little bit of good news, and then Grady, I'm going to turn it over to you for 30 seconds. Yeah, because I've gone well over time. You hey, wish. Yeah, I know, really. Yeah, you wish that uh, for those of you watching from a distance, no one believes that Grady will go short either. So three quick things, um, man. And talking about society and, and where our world is going, it has literally turned dark outside since we began this, but even figuratively, we live in a very darker, a much darker society than maybe we did. And that gives our candle greater illumination power, uh, which is good both for, man, for, for, for the community of, of Enoch, what this church does is so special, but it's also true um, for, for places where Oklahoma Christian and other Christian callers function. And God has promises for us, and God is in control. So I believe the world divides and fights differences. When they see differences, they fight them with anger and attacks and separation. I'm not referring to the presidential debate the other night. Okay, I wrote this way before <laughs> that. But what does God call us to? He calls us to pray for each other. He calls us to turn the other cheek. And he calls us to be present, not to shy away from the conversations, but to have the conversations. I'm reading a book with a small group that talks about all of God's promises to us. And I'm just kind of overwhelmed at being reminded of all the promises that he has given us. Um, and, and this is a really great list. And the very last couple of them, I mean, we have power and justice will prevail. Which takes us to this last slide. Uh, Jesus said that he's building his church and nothing's going to overcome it. Gates of Hades are not going to overcome it. And then to quote that theologian John Lennon, in the end, everything is good, and if it's not good, it's not the end. Um, and so I, that gives me, the scripture gives me more comfort than John Lennon's quote, but I kind of like John Lennon's quote as well. Grady, talk to us, uh, because in the era of COVID, while all these things are true, our world has kind of changed. So what's a few practical things for us? Uh, I'll be quick, Gordon. <laughs> okay. As you've been here, uh, according to my Apple Watch, my nephew gave me. Grady, if you could step up here. Uh, 
One hour and 31 seconds is where we've been so far. So I'll, I'll be really quick. I wrote it on a napkin. Uh, now I can't find my napkin. <laughs> so I do work in Oklahoma Christian a week a month, but my main uh, life in Irving, Texas, I live in Irving. I preach for 42 years in five different congregations, one of them twice. And so I've got a preaching background, youth ministry background, love church. And uh, uh, I work with Hope Network. And Hope Network is Dr. Tim Woodruff, if you read, he runs the interim ministry division with Hope Network, and we do mentoring and consulting. So all I live in is with preachers and elders and churches. That's really what I do all the time. Average week is five or six churches in contact, look, helping look for a preacher, processing eight or ten ministers a week. So that's the context that I speak out of. And so uh, fill in this blank. Here's the blank. Boy, I'd be glad when COVID's over so we can get back to normal. 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 Well, normal is no longer. And for years, us preacher types and church leaders have been saying, you know, if I was starting church again, I think this is what I would hold on to, and this is what I'd let go of in order to reach people and be God's people in the community. We have an incredible opportunity to do that right now. But leaders, I'm hearing, are so tired and worn out, they're zoomed up, zoomed in, zoomed out, and they just want to kind of hold on. I call it circling the wagons and take a defensive posture, hoping that when you get through it, things will get back to normal. There is no new normal. Uh, another a book I've been reading called Quietly Courageous by Gil Rendell, he talks about nostalgia is work avoidance. Because when we talk about getting back to normal, it's really a move to nostalgia. It's a move to nostalgia. And we weren't doing that great pre-COVID, right? We weren't knocking that... For, you know, pre-COVID, we weren't doing that great. So I have some practical suggestions um, uh, that uh, I'm hearing from churches and church leaders. Um, it's happening in Woodward, the Woodward Church. I've been helping them with a new vision and mission statement and some values. And um, th they're doing a pretty good job. Even during COVID, they've got a mission, a vision team meeting. And they're saying, let's take a look at who we are. Let's look at who we are. Let's look at everything we've been doing Pre-COVID, was it that effective? What do we need to let go of? What conversations do we need to have with the church rather than just preaching lessons to the church? What, what, and so they're looking at everything. So we have an incredible opportunity right now for elders, for leaders, not to just say, let's hold on and let's just wait till. We're going to be in this gig for a while. And attendance, if, if our only standard is Sunday morning church attendance, we're in trouble. We got to think ministry opportunity rather than church attendance because it's going to stagger back in over time. So the first move is prayer, Colossians 4, 2 through 6. How can you create prayer ministry? How can you get people to write down names, 7 to 10 names, and call them up and ask them what we can pray for? People in the church, people outside the church, people that you play so your kids play soccer with. You're like, I'm going to a church, and I know this is tough right now. Is there anything I can pray for? Because it, it's making prayerful, relational connections where you are. So number two, get to the short list. What do you mean get to the short list? Why doesn't this church do a few things really well and let go of a bunch of other stuff? What is going to be the core that we're going to hold on to and we're going to focus on, what is it, two or three things really well rather than all these programs trying to man them, trying to put this together, trying to put that together. Let's focus on equipping and doing a few things well. Take inventory of um, what really matters. Kind of put the pause button on and take a stop and say, during this time, let's, uh, let's look at everything we're doing. Some churches are doing it, not a lot because they're so tired and so exhausted and the elders are just saying, well, we're just going to hold on. Well, hold on will kill you in the future. It, 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 it'll actually kill you. And lastly, I think one of the best places we can, instead of thinking of programs we've got to kick up and do, why don't we have conversations with our people about what's on their heart and their burdens in their life and talk to them about what's your ministry burden or passion? and arrange our ministry approach around the gifts that are already present at the North Garland Church, the gifts of ministry that are already here, whether they're 82 years old or 15 years old. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation with our members, individuals, on their gifts. And so that's what I would encourage you, those kind of things. So 
we talk about the gay issue, which is a big issue. Um, do you have a gay friend? I do. And I'm in constant conversation. It's easy to make people objects rather than human beings. I guarantee you that young man right there knows people in his school that are gay. I promise you he does. So equip them, yes, but it's a conversational stuff. Here's the last thing, second to last, or the last thing. Um, that is, who do you know under age 30 that you can invite in and just say, talk to me about your view of life. Where are you in life? I was with a church of about 150. The elders just said, we're not reaching our young people. And I said, well, okay, um, there's seven of you elders here. You're meeting on this Tuesday night elders meeting. Why don't you invite three or four or five friends or three or four or five people under age 30 and just listen to them? Let the first move be listening rather than telling and straightening out. Well, why would we do that? I said, because it's a gospel move to listen rather than lead with telling. So those are a few things. This is a wonderful opportunity. I mean, an incredible opportunity we have to, to re-engage in some ways, simplify some things, and focus. John, you didn't get fast. No, I didn't. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and you know what? I, was I gave you a standing ovation. I was walking over here. <laughs> And I loved when you said uh, one last thing, and you said that four times. So that was really <laughs> I had to do that for Gordon. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, that was, that was awesome. Okay, one, one uh, more slide. Hey, uh, or, or maybe one more after this. I'll, I'll pull up uh, a gravy thing. Hey, you know, what about COVID? So I like to think about the fact that, that Christians, regardless of the times, we kind of meet them historically, bravely and creatively. I mean, think about... Think about what really spread the Christian faith the quickest at first. It was the persecution. Christians were kicked out of Rome violently, and they went all over the world, the known world, spreading the gospel. What happened in the arena or the Colosseum, it caused people to turn to God because of the example they saw, the, the Christians in their suffering. The plague. What was it the Christians did? The Christians took care of people. Hospitals today came out of our Christian movement. Uh, the Dark Ages, man, learning was going away, information was being lost, and it was the Christians who really saved it. Where have universities come? Well, they've come out of our faith. And uh, in international travel and countries opening, when those things happen, man, Christians go everywhere and spread the word. There are more Christians outside the United States than there are inside the United States. That's probably a pretty good lesson for us. Okay, man, OC, we, we appreciate um, the, the Enid Church family, and we want to serve you guys. We want to invite you all to our campus anytime. I know people aren't getting out a lot. If you come to our campus now, wear a mask. Uh, luckily, our students are wearing masks. It's pretty, uh, pretty impressive. If we can preach for you from time to time, man, give us some opportunities. Uh, we can maybe do it virtually. Grady has uh, a number of young men that want to become preachers, and there might be some opportunities there as well. And we want your students. Um, so we want, we want your kids to come to Oklahoma Christian so that we can kind of keep them on the road and the journey that you have set them forth on. And I've talked some about spiritual life on campus. Here's our contact information. Uh, it's really easy. It's our first name, dot last name, at oc.edu. And so I put Grady's phone number, his cell phone number, and his email address, and Kent's email address, and office number, and mine as well. God bless you guys. Boy, Friday night, thank you for coming and letting us be a part of this. Uh, it, it's been really, really great for us. We appreciate the hospitality and the time that you've given us. And uh, we, this, this congregation means a lot to us. <clears throat> Kent, would you close us in a word of prayer? Yeah. Father, we're thankful for uh, this great night. We're thankful for the beautiful weather that we've been having. We're thankful for the safe trip that uh, some of us had to uh, Eden today. Father, we're thankful for uh, this congregation. And we pray that it will continue to always be a light to this part of the state and specifically 
a tip to Enid, Oklahoma. We're thankful for the leaders. We're thankful for uh, the members of this church. Father, we ask that you pray. Uh, we ask rather that you be with us, uh, that you help us, that you guide us, that you forgive us. Uh, we're thankful for your grace. We're thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for your love. And most of all, we're thankful for Jesus who binds us and brings us all together. Thank you for blessing us. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saving us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. Thank you very much. We, we thank you for the wonderful thing you do for you. our young people and the world around us. Bless you. Thank you.